Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is a glamorous Hollywood legend and sex symbol who's been lighting up the silver screen for over seven decades. Since first being discovered by Howard Hughes, she's appeared in many iconic movies, including The All American, Running Wild, Born Reckless, High School Confidential, The Beat Generation, and of course, Untamed Youth, in which she was the first woman to perform rock and roll on the silver screen. After performing her rock and roll number for the second time in Teacher's Pet, co-starring Clark Gable and Doris Day, she became forever known as the girl who invented rock and roll. Her performances in movies like Vice Raid and Guns, Girls and Gangsters turned her into an icon in the film noir genre. Her provocative and courageous performances were way ahead of her time in movies like Girls Town, The Private Lives of Adam and Eve, The Beautiful Legs of Sabrina, and Sex Kittens Go to College. Here's a glimpse of some iconic moments in her amazing career. Mamie Van Doren. Mamie Van Doren. Mamie Van Doren. Mamie Van Doren. Mamie Darling. Mamie Van Doren. 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 I've got plenty of experience. Yeah, that's what I like about you. Mamie Van Doren, platinum and provocative. Mamie Van Doren, America's number one sex kitten. Where would I be if I just read books? You're looking for excitement? Relatives should always kiss each other hello and goodbye, polite like. Why shouldn't we eat it? Looks all right to me. I don't like a guy who can't hold his liquor. Rolling like a rolling stone. Go bingle your bungle. Get so weary just to rolling along. Gotta find a place where I belong. I wanna settle down with someone, never be alone. Instead of getting nowhere, like a rolling stone. I'm not to settle for cheap imitations. So I can't settle for you, buddy. Because you're a cheap imitation of a human being. Give me plenty of room, then. I take deep breath. <laughs> now, you've heard of instant coffee. You've heard of instant tea. See here, you guys, just feast your eyes on little old instant me. Cause I'm... You're looking at me. Yes, I'm the girl who invented rock and roll. Throughout her career, Mamie Van Doren has reached out to new and diverse audiences. She did two memorable tours in Vietnam. She had a highly successful nightclub act in Las Vegas. She's recorded six albums. She's performed in many theater productions and appeared in dozens of TV shows. She's performed with my favorite band of all time, Pink Martini, and recorded two songs with them. And she performs her song Journey on the first Realm album by Staunch Moderates. In 1987, she wrote a memoir, which she updated in 2013, entitled Playing the Field. And now she's released her brand new book entitled China and Me, Wing Flapping, Feather Pulling, and Love on the Wing, about her poignant and sometimes rambunctious 40 plus year relationship with her beloved pet, Malakan Cockatoo, named China. I'm delighted to welcome the incomparable Mamie Van Doren to our show. Mamie, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you, Harvey, for inviting me. That was so sweet of you. I love my introduction. 
<laughs> well, you did all that, if you can believe it. <laughs> and I'd like to say hello to all my Canadian friends and all my gay friends. And I wrote, I, I even, I even put some rainbows in my hair today for you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mamie, I want to start by talking about your new book. I found it absolutely delightful and actually quite moving. Tell us why you decided to write the book. Well, it's funny. I was, I'm on Facebook and Twitter and I had some pictures of China and the two of us. And he said, why don't you do a book on it? How could anybody live with a bird for 40, 45 years? And I, I, th and I thought about it and I said, no, a bird, you know, 40 years with a, with a bird. And I only lasted a couple of years with my husband, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, I think I'm, I'll give it a go. So I did. And I, in two years, it took me two years to write the book, but every word, you're going to see three people in this book. You're going to see Joni Olander, as I was when I was very, very, I was a child growing up. And you're going to see Mamie Van Dorn, which everybody knows, and you're going to see sort of the future. And I call myself Raindrop. And so Raindrop represents all three of us. And last night, very ironically, I went outside and it became, it started to rain. And I thought, we haven't had a rain in Newport Beach, California for quite a while. So I went out there and I sat and I put my face up to the sky and I, I, the rain just poured on me. And I thought, oh, this feels so refreshing. So anyway, that's my answer to why I wrote the book. China and I have a rapport. He cries like I do. He laughs like I do. We go to the beach together. He knows everything about me. He's been with me. He's in the house. I had him in a cage in the beginning, but he became too smart. He was smart ass bird, I'm telling you. And now he's in, I had a room made for him with a tree a special tree so he can't chew it. And he's lived there for a long time. He's been with me through a lot of troubles. He's only been with me through one husband and that's the one I got now. <laughs> wow, he's the keeper. Thomas is a real keeper. Now I wanna mention, I expected when I got the book that it would be a how-to book about how to raise Moluccan cockatoos, but it's not a how-to book, is it? Absolutely not. I'm, I'm not in favor of buying a large parrot or any bird, really a wild bird. Mine came from uh, the wild. It's not a domestic bird. It was one of the first ones. I happened to see it on entertainment tonight and Thomas and I got a wild streak up our ass and said, well, why don't we get a bird instead of a dog, you know? So we went to Parrot Mountain and we looked at the birds and we ended up with China. It was a really wild. When I got him, he was wild. <laughs> and so I said, I'll, I'll never be able to tame that bird. But in with a lot of patience and realizing how smart they are, I did it. And well, when you have a pet like China, does that become a lifestyle choice? Oh yes, this is a lifestyle book much more so than a how-to, of course. I, I just want people to know that wild animals shouldn't be caged. And can you imagine they fly the heavens and then they come in and they're put in a little cage. And I looked at a parrot and I thought, oh, they're supposed to be in a cage. You know, it looks good. It's not that way at all. Unless you're determined to keep one for many years to come. I mean, this bird is outliving me. I mean, maybe, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know what another 10 years are like, but I don't know whether I'm ever going to get to the double O's or not. But I mean, you just don't know. I mean, uh, <laughs> so. Well, I think you will and beyond. Can you tell me, Mamie, what would you say is the most challenging aspect of having a Moluccan cockatoo for a pet? The challenge is being able to put up their screaming. <laughs> they scream and, and, and if they want something to eat, they'll let you know. The challenge is just, I learned a lot from him. 
Well, you wrote in your book that through the process of raising and caring for China, you found a form of peace and happiness. Can you tell us about that? Yes, finding when I feel down, he cheers me up. I mean, I can kiss him and he likes to be preemed and he likes to be made love to and he just, I, they can teach you. Animals are so smart, much smarter than we are. <laughs> and uh, I, I admire them and, and that's kind of, when I got them, I never even had any idea how intelligent they are. But I think that this book would, would give people an idea what it's like to live and to, to that, uh, that birds are what they're like. I came from South Dakota. I was born and raised on a farm. No running water, no, no electricity. Was, I mean, they homesteaded. I mean, I'm talking about I'm nearly 100. I'm going to be 92 in a couple of hours. And God bless I, you. I, and I've been in the business for 80 years, <laughs> almost 80 years. I know. I, well, I want to tell you, I absolutely loved your memoir, Playing the Field, which was so candid and eye-opening. And I'm told that you're now writing a new memoir entitled Secrets of the Goddess, which you, yes. you're saying that it will be your definitive biography. Is this going to be an uncensored story of your life? You betcha. I, I put a lot of things in Playing the Field that... Putnam took out. Putnam was a very conservative publisher. And I was very disappointed that some of the stories that I had in there were not in there. So all the things that I, I, they wouldn't leave in, I'm putting them back in and I'm adding a lot of things. I'm just, I'm going balls to the wall. I'm just telling everything. Well, I mean, is when do you think the book will be out? Because I can't wait. Well, I've got already but there's so many things that are even happening since i started it five years ago i've had to rechange it i've gone back and i've redone it i've got a whole different idea of what i want to do i'm not putting the glamorous woman on the front of the pay the cover i've got an idea I, i'm going to be sitting on a dragon flying through the air <laughs> I mean, I want to do something different, and I, and I want to do maybe even the beginning, I want to do maybe, like in this book, I do illustrations. I'm even thinking about doing a cartoon, a little bit of cartoons of, of, of things that I can't show, <laughs> but only in a cartoon way. Well, Mamie, do you think there are things about your life that would shock people that we don't already know? Oh, of course. My life has been so wild and so exciting. My trip to Vietnam was a highlight of knowing what, what, what it is to live and be thankful of, of America. I mean, I was a conservative at one time. I was an Eisenhower conservative. I grew up during the war years. <laughs> And now it's a, it's, a dirt, it's a dirty word, you know. And of course, I'm, I'm not a radical, but I could be. <laughs> you mean I, a radical liberal? Yeah, Vietnam was a, a change in my life. I changed my whole life after I've been there and seen all the, all the things and thousands and thousands of our men dying, you know. It was very sad. Well... As I mentioned in my introduction, you did two extensive tours of Vietnam in 1968 and 1970. In fact, you performed at virtually every army base from the Mekong Delta in the south to the demilitarized zone in the north. And you are absolutely beloved by military veterans of all ages. What was it about going to Vietnam that really changed your perspective in life? Well, you want to know something? It changed my life just recently, big time, because I admit I had PT, PT, SD. 
Yeah, I had. You that. had post-traumatic Medicare. stress? And all, my, and all my veterans that saw me over there came to my rescue. And one in particular from Sydney, Australia, is, I, he really said, maybe I saw you in Quang Tree, but it was right near there. It was called Doc Ho, which is right near the DMZ, which we could have been attacked any minute. And I did performed on a tank, I remember. And he said, he said, I remember everything. He said, then my buddy Rick, Rick loved you. And I said, and he said that he swore that you winked at him. <laughs> he said, do you remember winking at Rick? And I said, yeah, I do remember. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, that's very sweet of you. And I think that he was, he was just being facetious. I, I was being facetious. So then, you felt that you had post-traumatic stress from performing in Vietnam. I, I have been, I've gone through it all my life. But he changed that because he said, maybe all the men that saw you that then are no longer with us. They were killed in action, in combat. So the last American woman and the woman they saw, I was it, I was the one. And so they went, they went to their end just seeing me. And I brought more happiness to them than anything could be. I mean, I'm so elated that I did something. And he says, when you have that, go to the window and say to yourself, be happy. Don't be sad because of what you've done. Well, and it is incredibly happy. remarkable that you did that. You know, Mamie, I find it so interesting that for your entire life, you've been compared to Marilyn Monroe and Jane Mansfield, but really deep down, you are nothing at all like them, are you? <laughs> oh, Harvey, kiss, kiss, kiss. Of course not. I'm, I, I, I'm not at all like either one of them. I'm not like anyone. I'm just so different. I'm not any like any, any human you've ever met. <laughs> Well, I know that you co-starred with Jane Mansfield in the Las Vegas Hillbillies. Did you get to know her very much? No, I didn't get, get to know Jane. She she did not, she wasn't very friendly. Uh, she was, I don't know, women with me, actresses in particular, they're very, they're jealous. I would come out and they're jealous. And I've got to treat that in a way of ignoring it, uh, what can I do? Even men, some of my male leads are jealous. They, they don't like it because sometimes I, they think I'm upstaging them. But you'll find the bigger they are, the, the more important they are. That's like Clark Gable. How could anyone upstage Clark Gable? I mean, they kissed out, okay, they left out my kissing scene with him because they thought I was too young to kiss Clark Gable. Well, come on. You know, I was 25 and he was, what, 59? It's nothing. I mean, what's kissing a guy 59? I was in love with this guy and I was in love with him from the time I was born, you know? And to kiss Clark Gable, oh my God. I could do 20 takes on that one. <laughs> <laughs> what about Doris Day? I don't think she would have been jealous of you. I've heard she was such a beautiful person. Oh, God, I always loved Doris Day. I mean, when she sang, you sigh, the song begins, the ma it's magic. Oh, my God in heaven. I just fell in love with Doris Day. And then when I got a chance to meet her, she was, she wasn't very friendly. And I was so unhappy about that. I wanted to put my arms around her and hug her. I tried to be more friendly with her, and she backed off a little bit. Finally, I just gave up, you know. Do you think, Mamie, that your beauty was actually something that worked against you in the business because of all that jealousy? Sometimes, yeah. yeah I think, I know. And at that time, I didn't realize that's what it was. I, I mean, in my youth, you know, I was, what, 10 years younger than she was. Age, if you're younger, uh, if you're if you're a bit prettier or you have bigger breasts, anything like that disturbs men and women on the screen. Everything is, 
you know, and uh, I'm smart enough to, to know, I learned from Howard Hughes. I watch, listen to his conversations on the phone. I've, I've learned from the best. You know? well, what would you say that Howard Hughes taught you that you didn't already know? Everything. <laughs> yeah. You mean about the business, he, the he industry? Made real, he made me realize he was a pedophile. <laughs> I mean, he was, he was with me when I just turned 16. And my mother, who was only 18 years older than I am, she was smart. She told me she didn't like Howard at all. And he didn't like her. And she forbid me seeing him. And I had to see him on the QT. And that's what I'm putting in this book. Because she was alive at that time. And I didn't want her to know <laughs> that I had been seeing Howard. Do you think that the husbands you've had, I mean, before Thomas, who's really been a remarkably supportive, loving husband, but the husbands you had before that, do you think they just couldn't handle being in the shadows of your career? I was so young. I never even thought really about my looks and my, my breasts and things. I never even thought about it. You know, I, I never thought that was an asset. I just, I wanted to have, you know what? If you're beautiful on the inside, you're going to be beautiful on the outside. I want to be beautiful on the inside. That's what I've always, and, and, and not just beautiful on the outside. And that's what I always strive for. I never want to hurt anyone, but it doesn't work that way all the time. But I just, that's how I've gone through my life. I've ignored I've gone like this and I tried to ignore, <clears throat> go to bed with thinking everything is going to be okay. You know, I think you have a marvelous attitude about life. What would you say was the happiest time for you in your career? Well, when I got my contract at Universal was the happiest day of my life because all of a sudden Joni Olander became the first lady's name, Mamie Van Doren. And uh, I didn't particularly like that name, but I said, um, I'll grow into that and I'll make Mamie Van Doren something that the people will love. Joni Olander, as you will read in this book, if anybody buys it, is, is another person. I came from another person. I, I mean, you have no idea how, how different I was when I was Joan Olander. But do you still feel her inside you? You know, the values, the sense of who you really are. Do you still feel that she's there? Oh, I, Clint Eastwood said, asked sometimes, they asked him, uh, how do you stay so young? And he says, because I keep the old man out. Well, <clears throat> I feel the same way. When someone says, oh, you look pretty, I say, well, I keep... Joni Olander inside, that little girl always stays with me. So I am always that little girl. And I never let that old fucking woman in, that's for sure. <laughs> well, there's been a lot written about the notorious casting couch in Hollywood. And you certainly had your share of unwanted advances by Hollywood men. Were you happy to see the Me Too movement finally emerge? The independence came along and it was fabulous. Uh, the studio, there wasn't one woman in the studio. It was all run by men. The casting couch. <laughs> uh, I bet, I'll admit I've been on the casting couch. But it was because I wanted to. Uh, if I didn't want to be on that couch, I wouldn't be on there. You could bet on that. My Swedish hereditary, my my wildness would let them know, let them know I, I don't want to be on the couch. But this particular director, I said, hey, like, you ready? <laughs> and I got the part too. <laughs> well, Mamie. You've been, a, you've been a very modern woman, much ahead of your time, your whole life. 
You've lived through the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the gay rights movement, the Me Too movement, the flip-flopping around abortion. What are your thoughts about the current state of America? Oh my God. Well, I'm gonna go back a little because I was one of the first ones to, to openly come out about the AIDS. Did you know that? Yes, I did. You were one of the very first supporters of the gay community yeah. that was dying. And nobody dared to come out and they didn't want to have their name linked to the word AIDS. I came out and I raised thousands of dollars, not, not, not a lot, but it was a lot then for me. And I went to all of the gay places, went to San Francisco. I spoke on television as much as I could because they didn't want me to talk about it. And I'm so, so proud that I did that and, I, and that my name is there. The, the things today versus yesterday, it's, it's shocking to me, my country today, that all of the generation, the great generation that went over to Europe and fought World War II, lost so many men so horrible things. And to think that these same people are trying to change our America into a Holocaust, it's crazy. It just doesn't make sense to me why they would want one dictator, one person to rule this beautiful country. Uh, and and, and they, they vote on these dummies up there. I mean, they're really stupid. But they vote these, you know, these people there and they just give them a lot of bullshit. And they listen and they believe this bullshit. I mean, it's unbelievable that, that people are like sheep. You see them. And, I mean, how do they even allow them to say this crap? You know, it's a good thing I'm not any younger. I mean, I'm not any, that I'm, I'm not real young then I could start over because I, I know that I would, I would be very much in the front now, not like Jane Fonda. I would do it the right way. But I, I could see myself trying to, to help and making people understand. I mean, the Iowa thing in South Dakota, I'm from that area and I know the people around there. I know the Midwestern. I'm a, I'm a Midwestern, but uh, lived in California all my, all my life but I know them and they believe people. They, they want to believe people and they want to believe all these good things they're hearing, but they got to realize it's not true. They're trying to be leader. They want you to know all these things and it's just hogwash. I want to ask you about something you wrote a while ago. It really resonated with me. You said, I truly believe that one of the reasons why I look and feel so well is because I have very few inhibitions. I don't care about age. Life is too short to worry about what other people think. Mamie, how long did it take you to really absorb and embrace that philosophy of life? The minute I got at the studio, my contract was when I realized you had no friends. You couldn't have a girlfriend. You didn't dare to go out with a guy on a contract. Because uh, in your contract, you don't mess with the contract player. You know, oh, you, you're gone, you know. You, you had to go out with, my first date was with Rock Hudson. <laughs> and if you read in Playing the Field, they said I was as safe as I was in my mother's arms. Well, we went to the Golden Globe Awards, sat with Joan Crawford, who I was named for. And I got home and he asked himself in for a cup of coffee or something. And of course, my mother had the coffee dripping in the kitchen. And I said, oh, I thought that was strange. He was asking himself in. So I said, okay, Rock, come on in. And I mean, I was on a contract two weeks. And they, I, my first date was with Rock Hudson. Well, I was just, you know. And while we were there, all of a sudden, his hands came up behind me and placed them on my breasts. And I go, ooh, 
he's gay. <laughs> I don't think so. we didn't have the word gay then. But uh, I thought, hmm, he's he wants me to kiss him, maybe. So I turn around and we kiss. And we started and we ended up on my my mother's linoleum floor. <laughs> Did you read my book? <laughs> And I had a crinlin skirt on from the department, the, the wardrobe department. And he, uh, <coughs> all over my dress, <laughs> my crinlin skirt. Maybe it's still standing up in the, <laughs> in the wardrobe department now for all I know. <laughs> so let me ask you, you've been married to your husband, Thomas Dixon, for 43 years. There were four marriages before that, plus you had many relationships with some of the most famous men in Hollywood, but this time you really got it right. What makes Thomas different from all the other men you've known? Well, he's a good human being. He's a lot like I am, and but yet we're opposite. But I met him, he's a, a liberal, and I was a conservative then. And... He changed that. He changed me for the better. And <clears throat> the things that I didn't, as young as he was, I, he just got out of the Navy in the Vietnam War. I met him down in Florida. He was an actor. And he was my leading man. And he was uh, 27, something, late 20. And I was 44. And I said, I never got anybody with it. Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, no, I never married anybody. No, I married a 19 year old, but I was only 31. But this one was different. We became friends because we worked together for a year on a play. Then he didn't want to stay in Florida. He wanted to come to California, see if he could do something on TV. And, he, and uh, so I said, well, come on out, stay with me. My son was 16 then. So there's like 10 years between my son, Perry, and Thomas. And then there's like 15 years between Thomas and me now. So he's 75 years or something to see I'm like, now. So I guess he got along with my son. He treated my son right. He liked animals. He liked everything I did. And he was, uh, he's honest. He didn't lie. And if he cheated, I could. I could tell right away, <clears throat> men can't get away with that with me. I got a sniffer like a dog. <laughs> I want to ask you, you have, in addition to your new <clears throat> memoir, you're producing a coffee table book of never before seen photos, and you're calling it The Unseen Mamie. When will that book come out? After my uh, uh, goddess picture. I, I can't do all of them. But I'm collecting pictures as I go along, but I can't put that. I've got to do one at a time. And if I'm still here, hopefully, and if I'm not, Thomas will continue on putting the pictures up. Oh, Mamie, you're still going to be here. You're feeling well, aren't you? Oh, I'm well. I, I have no, no problems. It's just a couple of, I had a back problem and I have a problem walking with my back a little bit, but Health-wise, I'm like I'm 60, you know, but and I'm sharp as a tack. Um, well, I have a feeling I know why you have back trouble. Why? <laughs> <laughs> now, I only have one more question for you, Miss Mamie Van Doren. When you look in the mirror and you think back over all the adventures, the triumphs, and the difficult times of your life, and you think of growing up in Rowena, South Dakota, as Joan, Lucille, Olander, have you been happy with your life? Do, are, are you happy with how your life has gone? Born in Rowena, South Dakota in 1931, in the height of the depression, was not a piece of cake. I know what hunger is. I've gone to bed hungry. I've had to sleep in cars, no medicine, no antibiotics. If you got sick, we had a horse doctor to take, take care of you. People were getting scarlet fever. They were coming to the house, taking 
the, the, the morgue, they take him to the morgue one day after the, the car would come up, take part of the family. Families were wiped out. Only the, the strong survived. The weak did not. And the first 10 years of my life, I spent most of them with, with my grandmother and grandfather because my mom and dad were wild. I mean, they were motorcycles and my dad was like a hellion. My mother was wild for in those days. I grew up with mom, my grandma, my father and my grandmother and I wasn't happy with them either. So the first 10 years were the unhappiest years of my life. And when I came out here when I was 11, World War II, it brought me out here. My life started turning around. I got healthier. I communicate better. I like the people. It was warmer, the climate was better for my health. And from then on, my life started taking a turn. And then I went to Hollywood and I went to Palm Springs and I was in a contest and they saw me and my beauty or whatever they had right away, it opened the doors for me. I met Huntington Hartford. I met all the rich men. They love young girls. So I got all these opportunities to meet them. And from there, I, I absorbed all of the information I could get. And then I knew when I was doing his kind of woman for Howard Hughes, I was kind of a small part, you know, and Bob Mitchum and Jane Russell were in the car. And I knew I had to have some drama lessons. So I started taking drama lessons and I started learning how to act. And it came so natural. I says, God, this is easy. I, mean, I don't like to memorize, but I started. And then I started doing plays. And that's when I was discovered from a talent scout at Universal. And uh, they took me, they said there was a role for me in Forbidden with Tony Curtis and Joanne Drew and, and they needed a singer, a nightclub singer. Well, I sang too, because my manager and Sven Gali at that time was Jimmy McHugh, who was putting me through school. He was paying for my drama lessons because I, I got introduced and he liked me and he's another elderly man. So I got lucky from that and then from that, they discovered me and I sang and they put me in a contract seven years and I got my, I tested for a role called the All-American opposite Tony Curtis and I got the role. I tested against three other girls and I got the role and I, I didn't go to bed with the director <laughs> or the producer. Universal didn't have big plans for me. I did Yankee Pasha and, but I learned I went to school there and I went to UCLA at the same time I would go to UCLA and learning from the professors there, they come to the studio and they teach you diction and like everything. I learned everything. I, it was a wonderful, wonderful chance for me. Then of course I met Ray Anthony, the famous band leader and uh, every woman in the world wanted him. She was dating Marilyn Monroe and then uh, he dated, I had a blind date with him, with uh, Bob Francis, who was under contract at Columbia, introduced me to him. And I dated him and I kept dating him and I got pregnant and we got married. And then when I got pregnant and they knew I was gonna have a baby, Universal dropped me. And I was so glad, it's the only way I could get out of my contract. They said, glamorous women do not have babies. You're too young to have babies. So, yeah, I just told them to go fuck themselves, you know, and I, uh, I had my Perry and I'm so thankful I did. <laughs> and I, and then Ray and I, after two and a half years, well, we lived together two and a half years and then we stayed together for five or six years. And then finally we, we divorced. And then, uh, cause I went to Europe and did movies and he didn't like it. And cause I was gone all the time and he was, he was, uh, you know, having fun. M.M. was involved with that one. Well, I'll write about that one, too. <laughs> anyway, that's about. So when you look back at your life, are you happy with the life you've had? Are you proud of what you've achieved? It's one thing I'm proud of. Not going to Vietnam. That's, that's the, oh, 
that's the main thing I was proud of. And I'm proud of the Universal. It enabled me to get a name, to be able to go to Vietnam and have them see a movie star. If it was the last woman they saw was me, that to me, mucho corazón, mucho corazón. And I, I hope I can meet them someday. It's well, Mamie, I must tell you, it's been such an honor and a pleasure having you on our show. You're not only one of the greatest blonde bombshells in cinematic history, you're a profoundly talented, intelligent, creative human being. You've reinvented yourself so beautifully over the years. You're a true inspiration on so many levels. Thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. Oh, Harvey, bless your heart. I love you very much. And I, I, I love, I love your, the gays. I adore them. I'm right there in the corner in every fucking way. And um, I'm looking forward to doing your show again when I, I get the goddess move, the picture. I hope that I can get that finished before I leave Mother Earth. <laughs> You're not leaving anytime soon. I want to thank you so much. Harry, you are the best interview I've ever had. Thank Tell you so me. much, Mamie. I love you. <laughs> I love you too. And before we go, Mamie, I just want to express my appreciation to Alan Mercer and Jeffrey Dalrymple for facilitating this interview. I know they're very dear friends of yours. Oh, yes. Alan Mercer, the greatest photographer I've ever had. And Jeffrey is, I adore him. And he said, oh, I'm so excited you're doing Harvey's show. That was the last message I got from him. So I did it. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. We love you. Thank you, Alan. We love you too. Absolutely. Our guest has been the fabulous and irrepressible Mamie Van Doren. Her new book, China and Me, Wing Flapping, Feather Pulling, and Love on the Wing, is now available wherever books are sold. You can follow her blog at mamievandoreninsideout.wordpress.com. And she's also very active on Facebook and Twitter. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you to my team in LA and the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. God bless. Love you and thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.